and we are giving continuation to our series of studies, we can say studies, um, and we will dive into the idea of study later on, why we say study, um, on the book Thought and Life. This is session seven of this beautiful, amazing book where we've been studying three chapters at a time, uh, visiting three chapters. We have done, we have covered quite a bit. So we ask everyone, perhaps those following us on the web as well, to go back to the um, um, videos that, or the recordings for the previous chapters. Um, tonight, we will be studying chapter 19, 20, and 21. Um, would like to start, as we usually do, with a um, little disclosure. Um, and going back to what I was just mentioned, uh, the idea of study, um, one of the things that we find very hard, <laughs> actually two things, is to separate these chapters because one really um, connects with the other, connects with the next, connects with the previous, it connects with the first chapters that we talked about, the mirror of life, our will, cooperation, and so on and so forth. So it's really hard to separate them. So if you really need help um, understanding some of the concept, please go back to the first sessions, go back to the second, the third, whatever, um, to make sure that we have a better understanding. And do not stop yourself from reading the book. Get the book and read, because this is a manual that Emmanuel, the mentor of Chico Xavier, put it together for us here, incarnated on Earth, for us incarnating, reincarnating on Earth, um, and guide us as a guidance, as a guiding, um, um, for us to live a better life. So it's never too late for us to start, as we have mentioned, reading the book as this manual for us to live a better life, as well as when we go back to our spiritual nature, we go back happier than perhaps um, we wouldn't be if we want not to read this book. The second thing is to, when we, when we go back and say this is more a study than anything else, it's because we bring a lot of text, and we say this uh, with our hearts full of joy and sometimes really saying, oh gosh, we're going to read. But it's really hard to put some things aside and not find it very important to share with one another because every word, every sentence that Emmanuel brings has a, it's like a treasure hidden in somewhere that we find and we're like, we want to share, we want to make sure that we uh, bring that to one another. So going back to this, last time, to the list of year of chapters, last time we talked about the vocation, the profession, the society. When we talk about vocation, we talk about profession, it implies something, right? That we have something within ourselves that we use with one another, right? That a vocation is something that I do well, but I don't keep it to myself. I can't keep it to myself, right? It implies us going and utilizing to society. No wonder he puts all three of them together. And then today we talk about prosperity, habit, habit, and duty. And the third thing that I would like to add that is extremely hard <laughs> after reading this book is to put these things in perspective, into perspective in our lives. In my, and I say this in, in my life, actually. And we, the, the question comes in to ourselves to say, how is this helping me in my life, right? And to take these thoughts that are so elevated from our day-to-day -day lives, from what we see on earth and put into practice, it takes quite a bit. And I've been asking myself, how do we do this? How do we take the concept that we will learn here today and reanalyze them with different eyes or understand them differently than what the world has been offering when we talk about prosperity, when we talk about habit, and when we talk about duty. Consequently, obviously, the same thing will happen when we talk about guilt, assistance, so on and so forth. It's extremely hard. The only way that we have, that I would like to propose, that I've been proposing to myself and propose to others, is to look at these topics with different glasses. Different glasses. No, think of as if we're putting the glasses of eternal life. Well, Leo, we are eternal. We know this. We study this here and there. But do we truly apply it? 
that every action that we are not even acting yet, <laughs> proposing or even thinking or not even think of yet, we are thinking with the eternal glasses. Or if we would like to put a dress or something, we are doing so with this idea of a future, not a short, a, a, like a short-term idea. It's very long. We're talking about a hundred years, two hundred years, a thousand years from now. It's very hard. Again, when we are right here in this physical body, right? And clouds related, like really, like sometimes we want. There is not even a way for us to escape from our daily struggles. But we need to do this. We need to really put this struggle through and work through it so we can think that way. So tonight, I know it's a long disclosure. Let us think with the idea of multiple lives, of eternal beings that we are, okay? Because when we think of prosperity, we think of what? Money. Right? To look at the idea of prosperity, what we think? What else? Money. Success. Yeah. Uh, success. success. Success where? Because success is very broad. Professionally. Professionally. Yeah. What else? Um, health. 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 Relationship. Relationship. What else? All, all, all areas of life, right? Relationship. Most of the time, most of the time, they have to do with our materialistic views. Because the first thing that comes to mind as we notice is money. It's right here, success, health, longevity, health, right, money. But Emmanuel comes and kind of asks us to really change. And it's hard, it's really hard because the concept, the idea is really different. And we have to, we're, we're being educated, we're being invited to change this perception of prosperity. So he says the following, prosperity on the earth generally means wealth and happiness. Many want to possess it so they can attain a prominent social status, authority, or power. People spend a great deal of energy during their lives to acquire advantages. Occasionally, the media reports those who study the occult as a way to obtain prosperity. There are millions of people today who seek after gold and prestige with the same eagerness of primitive people on a hunting expedition. In pursuing whatever he values in life, man mobilizes his mental energy which stems from his emotions and desires. If the mirror of, of the heart is constantly focused on certain objects and situation, it leads us to the elements of our soul's desire. So he's covering what we already know, that it has to do with health and has to do with um, happiness, the happiness of the physical body, the happiness of this life, the happiness of five years now, or what I can see, the degree that I want to get, uh, the job that I would like to get, the husband, the wife, uh, the prosperity for a, um, a loved one, which a lot of these things, they're okay. And I would say most of them are okay. There's nothing wrong to be, to find or to seek pr prosperity but we'll see what are the dangers of us seeking this prosperity. And as he says here, it stems the same way as we were, the, the pursuit, of it, pursuit of it stems the same way as if we were hunting back in primitive times for food, for shelter, for our community, to reserve ourselves from the elements, preserve ourselves from the elements. I am not saying this, the, the Emmanuel saying is right there. So we, we have to change this. So it's a primitive idea that we have within ourselves now that we have conquered a whole lot, that we're not primitive beings anymore, but we're still doing the same way in the same manner. So when we put ourselves, put our energy, as he says here, mobilizing our mental energy to these things, what do we do? That's all we think about it, right? It's the idea of falling in love. That's all we think about it. We think about the other individual. It's the idea of falling in love with something material, buying a car. I want that car. And all that you think about is buying that car. Well, I want that degree. All that you think about is that degree. Or I want to buy a house. All that you think about it is. 
And it's okay if for a specific short amount of time you do so to accomplish it, but you do not become that situation. You, not, you do not become that moment because sometimes that's all we do. And then we do it for such a long period of time that we forget about ourselves, that we forget about who is around us and our true purpose in life. So he continues to say the following, we should not forget, however, that in our arduous journey towards the divine glory, we oftentimes confuse ourselves with the object of the, our attention. We then dwell in a certain sector of our struggle according to the extent and duration of our, of our aims. We become what we are pursuing. It just becomes us. And people notice. And people notice. Like a film projector where a story is told by frames that succeed one another, our personal experience is a series of reflexes about our feelings. These registered feelings generate the succession of ideas that in turn cast the theme of our struggle. The mind then associates and identifies itself with these reflexes, clinging to them like a turtle which retracts into its protective shell. There are many, many cases right here. We have cases in our um, in mystic meetings already of individuals who die and they connect with something that they did exactly this right here. All that they thought that prosperity was their house and they stay in the house after they lose the physical body. They fight for the, the property like if they were still in the physical body. And we can extend this to anything in life, not only the physical property, but an individual who, was, who stayed behind, the wife or the husband, the kids, they were my kids, the spirit to center, anything. Well, it's true. If we, if we, again, acknowledge that we are spiritual beings, but we are so connected with the physical body the way we are, with the materialistic thoughts, guess what? It's a possibility, and we have to help one another waken ourselves up. Because this is what happens here when we think of the idea of prosperity. Now, for this reason, the concept of prosperity as understood in the world is always debatable. Not everyone knows how to possess, increase, or manage, but increase, excuse me, or manage prosperity in a way that follows those sacred objectives of creation. Look that everything that Emmanuel says has a purpose. He said up here, towards the divine glory, all the, on the first paragraph. Down here, he's talking about us not knowing how to um, manage these um, uh, prosperity in a way that follows those sacred objectives of creation. Daniel last week talked about divine assistance, right? What is the, our connection with God? Before we can get to divine assistance, understanding ourselves a little bit, our nature, and understanding God, right? And we can say directly what God is in the sense of perhaps a, um, um, a Jesus-like, um, a Christ-like spirit may understand. We know that the, the, the a great definition that we have through the Spirit's book, right? And we know what? The attributes of God. And sometimes it's helpful for us to understand as well what is God, what God is not. <laughs> so we don't fall into temptations of doing things or saying things that doesn't correspond with one another. So we talk about this assistance and we wish that Daniel perhaps bring that talk here again and we can record it and we can present as well because it would be a really an amazing um, help to this work as well. And we, we see that it's something that is within us, around us at any time, at our disposal but also for others. And this is something that we're going to add in this idea right here because we already said it. Prosperity is not only for me, but prosperity is for others as well. And one of the things that we all question, right, is the riches, the masses that are going through hunger right now, people who are in need. And we think about prosperity. What if these individuals had something, had more, and I'm not saying that they should go through what they're going through, because if they're going through, if we're still a, a planet of trials and expiation, it's because of our pride. And we're not helping one another. But what if people, what if we were to share 
the, all the riches of the of the the planet equally to each one of us do we think that we would be able to multiply to increase it to hold the necessary and sh continue to share very likely not <laughs> i would say 90 percent of the time we would fail on how to handle the money that we receive just a thought for us so we must have a purpose like everything in life we must have a purpose and Emmanuel says the following there are many who continuously reflect upon ways to acquire wealth and they succeed however if they do not employ wealth for the general good they merely fall into their own pit until they decide to stop their greed many people today eagerly toil and crave personal prominence they become renowned in the areas of science religion literature and arts but if they do not active, activate these abilities to help in the education of their fellow beings, they will almost always, despite intelligence and fame, suffer the mentally rebounding effects of extravagance, thereby falling to a dangerous base of purification. It's not just money. It's also these areas that he said here, science, religion, and everything else. There's got to be a purpose. If we want prosperity, prosperity for what? Well, what kind of prosperity? Because we notice here at the beginning of this chapter, discussing this chapter, that there are many areas. Prosperity for me may be, will definitely be something completely different than prosperity is for Yasko, for Laura, right? So what am I going? What is my aim? And then what is the purpose? How am I going to use this? What are the benefits that not only me, but others as well, will receive from this? This is the question that perhaps Emmanuel is asking us to really think about it and to multiply it with one another. To finalize this part, <clears throat> he says, that is why prosperity is more deplorable than material poverty itself. A table without food and a cold stove are sometimes a valuable means of reparation. Sumptuous banquets and full purses often develop into guilt feelings from which the only way out is through long periods of struggling and darkness. Hold the guilt idea because we're going to talk that about on session eight <laughs> because that's the two, three, uh, three chapters down the road, okay? In other words, reincarnation. In other words, coming back into a situation that is perhaps for what we consider most of the time deplorable, for us to really take those mental reflexes that we propose onto ourselves and onto others as well and change. We need to find balance. <laughs> it is the balance that he's asking us to go after. And I brought this passage from the Gospel according to Spiritism on chapter 16, item 7, when Lazar says the following, undoubtedly wealth is a very slippery trial, more dangerous than poverty because of its allure, the temptation it creates, and the fascination it exerts. It is the supreme arouser of pride, selfishness, and lust. It is the strongest tie that keeps human, humans bound to the earth and diverts their thoughts from heaven. The distractions. This is not to say, folks, and this is also in the Gospel according to Spiritism, when it talks about, uh, when we learn about the, the trials of uh, the same part, uh, the same chapter, with the trials of riches and the trial of poverty. That if there wasn't, if riches, riches all, of all sorts were not good, God would not allow it. Because there are a lot of successful individuals that they come back in the crib, in the golden crib that we talk about here, right? And they do extremely well. They multiply it. That doesn't mean that these individuals have to go to society and giving $100,000 to whatever individuals they see, but they multiply it by giving a job, by giving possibilities to other people, creating a company. That is the multiplication that many of us, including myself, perhaps would not know how to do it, how to execute. So this is the idea that we have to rethink. And if we start rethinking collectively with the means that we have, with the riches that we have, perhaps we'll multiply even further what we have 
helping these other individuals to do the same. Because later on, we will see in the following chapter, how do we find, how do we receive assistance? Much like Daniel spoke yes, um, last week, how do we receive assistance? It's by raising ourselves. It's by doing and trying to reach out that we also receive the, um, the reach out from uh, up above. To finalize, religious people may ask, why does God protect the material progress of the ungodly? The fact is that such fortune does not really exist. Prosperity that is devoid of right conduct is nothing but an unlawful acquisition of things. It is like shiny clothes covering hidden wounds. The false sense of prosperity requires new thought reflexes that are contrary to the errors that produce them. True prosperity, when transformed into service, education, love, and righteousness, confers to the spirit the, prominent, the predominant reflection of light. We have to redefine. In our lives, it's easy for Emmanuel to come and give us this concept or this reanalysis of what um, prosperity is, but we have to change in our lives. And to me, and I, again, I share this with you, the only way that we can do this is by thinking and accepting and truly living in our lives that we are eternal. There's no other way. Otherwise, we will get stuck into the, the, the mundane things that we see. You turn on the TV, you are bombarded with ideas that this is the best way to live. You live once. <laughs> you, you go into on social media, that's all you see, right? What are the purpose? And the, the same thing we can, we can ask when we are talking to people, not that we won't be respectful, but talk to people, what, are, what is the purpose of us as individuals doing such a thing or society doing this, this group of people, that group of people? What is the purpose? Where will this take us, right? I am quite certain, as we were studying back uh, on Thursday about worship, the law of worship, that God will find ways to lead us to the right place, right? We can run, we cannot hide, right? As much as we try to um, excuse ourselves, and we'll see this when we talk about duty, excuse ourselves from what we have to do, the, the, the true reasons why we're here, time will find us, that we have to go back and, and, and alleviate and do the things that we have to multiply the riches that we have, but why wait? Why wait? On this idea, we move on to our next chapter, habit. Ha ha, <laughs> everybody's like, wow, I haven't seen. <laughs> good or bad, right? Are they good, are they bad? What kind of habits are we developing? Oh, developing habits. What are the old ones that we want to get rid of? Well, I don't have any, good, but stay here with us still, okay? <laughs> stay here with us. We need to rethink about habits. And I'll bring the idea of, again of purpose, and let's marinate on this idea, okay? Emmanuel says the following. Habit is the accumulation of mental reflexes whose function is to induce routine. <laughs> I've heard something really interesting, because every time I hear, let me take a step back, every time I, I read and hear this idea of mental reflexes, right? I have to go back sometimes to the first chapters, the second, uh, the sec first chapters of the book in general, and revisit this idea of mental reflexes. It's, it's so, um, it, it's a new idea, and it's a um, refreshing idea, but it's still hard, right? Because we're emanating all the time. And we think that in order for me to emanate this idea or to send this reflex, I really have to say, okay, Please give me the sun, give me the sun, give me the sun. No, I'm emanating just by the way I walk, just by the way I behave. Um, and in the most subtle ways of our behaviors, we are emanating thoughts, we are emanating feelings. And I heard this thing that is extremely interesting, that every time we go back to this book, much like the, uh, the codification and other books as well, this book is, it has a, a, of a, a kind of a quantum, um, 
property that it multiplies <laughs> that every time you go back to, uh, to, uh, to a chapter, you're like, wait a minute, that wasn't there when I read it. <laughs> I have a copy of it, wait a minute. So it, it really changes, really blows our minds when we were reading these things. And it's like, what are these mental reflexes, right? So habit is the accumulation of these things. It creates a routine. All, we, all of us here have routines. The good ones, the bad ones. And guess what? We said and that we all have, but we sometimes don't acknowledge that others have. If I, tomorrow morning, if I knock on Dion's door at 6 o'clock in the morning, and she's going through her 6 o'clock morning routine on a Sunday, look at this. Now it's a different because it's a Sunday. It may be a different routine than a Saturday. It's going to throw her off. <laughs> She's going to be like, Leo's at my door at 6 o'clock in the morning? What is he doing? I'm just giving this example for us to think down the road. He, he says the following. We inherit thousands of years of repeated experiences, each one similar to the other. Up to now, we have been like a boat carried away by a river, um, a river of habit to which we have offered no resistance. It's like we're going with the flow, right? We're going with, with the flow. Everybody wakes up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I will do 7. <laughs> I will do 7 or 8, right? But I will have to wake up as well because everybody wake, wakes up at, at, um, early. Therefore, with few exceptions, <clears throat> we have become consumers of other people's thought by an automatic reflex action of the mind. Consequently, we exaggerated our needs and refused to adopt a simpler standard of living which could make our life easier. We then become defensive regarding our demands and cruel towards our neighbor, our neighbor. And when we hurt that person, we hurt ourselves. The same old way. Okay, and we're going to continue a little bit on the same old way. Let us think about this. We're in this river of ideas. Okay, you know, it's okay. We, 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 we have to get up in the morning. We have to do this. We have to do that. We have to go to work. We have to go to school or we have to send our kids to school. This, whatever routine we have, whatever habit we have, we develop, right? And we continue to do so over and over and over. There's nothing wrong thus far because we have to f accept the flow of life. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is that, number one, when we allow ourselves to continue into these habits that take us nowhere. It's con a continuous river that will never lead us to the big sea of the universe, right? Of developing new habits that we're going to talk about in, the, in, in, in the, um, the next couple slides. The second thing is that whenever there is a stop on that river, we get upset. Think about it. When you have a routine, Saturday afternoon, somebody calls me. Well, you know I'm going to the center. <laughs> or, or somebody schedules something for Saturday afternoon. Guess what? I'm not going. I'm not going. <laughs> it will be a conflict. And I do get my conflicts because sometimes I do think, you know, should I go? Should I? But we have other, we created habit that's going to take us somewhere. Now, there are certain situations that perhaps we have to make some changes. So analysis and say, this will be important as well in my life, right? But we should treat it normally. We should help one another normally. I'm just giving you an example, a simple example. Because if we don't do that, we then start hurting other people and hurting ourselves as well. Because we do not want to get on of, out of our own ways of life. Now, take this to uh, something that is more important in your life, and you will feel the fire, right? Or when you were at work, when you were, you know, doing something, a task at work that is so intrinsic in your DNA that you have to get this done by this certain time, and your manager comes to you and say, oh, get this done. Guess what? We'll feel upset. We'll feel upset. But how flexible are we? How flexible are we not to create this whole thing? Emmanuel goes further to say the same old way of life. This also causes us to create a complex mechanism of cause or caution and distrust that reaches beyond the need of self-preservation. We become passionately possessive, thus creating mental reflexes of egotism, pride, and fear. In a vain desire to elude divine laws in most instances, 
excuse me, in most instances, we act like inattentive and unfaithful workers who neglect the valuable resources which allows us, allow us to serve with dignity. Instead, depressed and disquieted, we bring suffering upon ourselves. I don't want this in my life. Leo, go to your home. It's six o'clock in the morning. I don't have time for you right now, as the example that we gave with Dione, right? Knocking on her door at six o'clock in the morning. Instead of saying, wait a minute, if he's here six o'clock in the morning, there's gotta be a reason. I don't know yet, but let's, let me find out. But the self-preservation mode of us tells us what? This is not right. And then we get mad, we get upset, and we send these vibrations. Now, before sending the vibrations, where is the vibration being generated from? From ourselves, our minds, our hearts. It goes through our physical body, and then it creates pain here, pain there. And then we blame that is the weather. We blame this, and we blame, and we forget to take responsibility for who we are, for what we are not accomplishing. In general, the human race lives this recurring cycle of ignorance and foes not one to counteract it. We seek to deceive ourselves after birth, only to become completely disillusioned after death. Thus, we are imprisoned in the confines of an illusion-disillusion syndrome. Century after, se century after century, we return to tread the same road from where we were expected to go forward. This is so, like, it's like to really think about this is tough. It's not easy. To think that perhaps there are certain things that I left undone or I, the, the disturbance that I created 10 years ago and perhaps I may not have the opportunity to fix them in this lifetime and I have to do in the following lifetime is pretty tough. So let us think. Each one of us have in our habits, in our conditions, the skills, the capabilities to think, what do I need to change now? What did I have to change yesterday? And ask God for this opportunity to change, right? So we're not going back to the same issues of the past. However, we should not by any means disregard a constructive routine. Through it, people revolve in space and time to attain the resources that dignity, that, that dignify their lives. Excuse me. Thank you, Yasko. Dignify their lives. There's nothing wrong with habits. And we should do what? Create new habits, right? There is a starting point. We have to invite one another. We have to, every morning, say, let me do something different. This is the best way for us to wake up in every sense of the word. If you're feeling tired, do something that you never did. Scratch yourself with the other arm. <laughs> Try to do something. You will see that your body will respond immediately saying, whoa, something, something different, right? That's why we say throw some cold water in your face because you never cold throw, cold, um, throw cold water in your face. And when you do, you truly wake up. There are so many things that we can do to change and become better that will allow us to grow. What we think that we, when we think that we do that test so well, Try to do it in a different way. Perfect it. And do it again. And do it again. Evolution demands that we develop new habits. That we detach ourselves from lower forms and walk towards higher stage of existence. This is why we see in Christ a divine landmark of human renewal. A whole program of basic spiritual transformation. Without violence of any form. Look what he says. He alter the moral standards by which the earth had lived for several thousand years. He offered, number two, he offered the practice of forgiveness to replace systematic condemnation and to replace the usual racism. He offered the concept of genuine brotherhood to uplift sadness and discouragement. He gave us the Beatitudes as a comfort to the afflicted who know how to wait and to the righteous who know how to suffer. Remember what we said about a thousand years. Well, let's say 10 years, 50 years, 100 years and a thousand years. The idea of the future, of future lives, of eternity. Jesus didn't say, oh, this is only for 10 years from now. 
he changed the status quo for humanity, for what we're still trying to perfect in our daily lives. So we are being invited to do the same thing. So when we think about what is this new habit that I would like to start in my life or to begin in my life, think how much this will help you, not only the now and tomorrow, but a thousand years from now. It may say, oh, Leo, but I don't understand what's going to happen a thousand years from now. But think as a stepping stone for you to get to the next step and to the next step. And guess what? Other people are watching. Perhaps people may need your, to know about your struggles. That's why professors, when they become professors, they talk about their struggles as well. I've been through this. You can do it as well. Parents, they were kids once. And we go through certain things in life that say, no, look, I went through this situation. It wasn't the same thing, but it was similar. So let me tell you about it. Perhaps this can help, right? Not that people we should go and tell our struggles to everybody, but sometimes that helps. And this is the same thing in life. The way Jesus, our um, higher mentor here on earth, right, our governor, as we learned with spiritism, did so. And he invited us by doing the same thing because we are capable to do so. He did it for, for all of us. So there is a change. Inevitably, there is a change in our lives. Jesus' apostleships becomes a resplendent set of reflexes aimed at the redemption of the human way. He taught the virtue of simplicity when he began his pilgrimage amongst humanity that originated in manger. His death on the cross taught us serenity, patience, and belief in the resurrection and eternal life. This idea of shifting came very, um, it was, it was um, not alarming, but it, it, it only sunk in when I started thinking about, because it's hard for us to think about at, at times, uh, each one of us have a way to interpret, but um, about Jesus directly. Because he already, at that time, was a, and still is, a perfect spirit. So let us think about those around Jesus. Because he talks about apostleship here, that, that's how it happened. That's the, the, that is the word that helped me understand this, the apostles. Before they met Jesus. They had their habits, right? Imagine how that was. Peter, Matthew, all of them. The, 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 the apostle that perhaps we connect the most, or the person, the figure that you have read in the Bible, you have in co come in contact with, that you connect the most. Imagine how was that person's life, that spirit's, the spirit's life, before they met Jesus. Very mundane, very connected with what um, the environment, right, as we study here, that we are product of the environment, led them to. And now, think about them after they met Jesus. After all the proposals that Jesus brought to them, talking to them directly and saying, let us change. And there is something more that we, can, we cannot even grasp, right? Some of us can, to a certain degree, the vibrations that when the master said something, right? That the, the life eternal, the idea of resurrection that to them was their idea of the eternal life. That's why Emmanuel puts here the resurrection and eternal life whichever way they accept it. Imagine the shift. Imagine the new habits that they had to create. All the things that they have to give up to follow the path that they were invited to go to. There were some that say, no, this is not for me. And they went back the same way that they were before. And we see this in many um, examples. And here we're called again to create these new habits a thousand years from now <laughs> not to create but to really see the benefits right for ourselves and for others even now justice in the world dispels revenge and love revenge and love is tainted with selfishness this is due to our unreasonable attitudes during all the millennia that preceded today however we cannot ignore the fact that only kindness and understanding reflect true happiness as it is then 
that we nurture real goodness. We have the obligation to educate ourselves and to serve, creating these everyday habits by co cooperating in the safety and happiness of all beings, even at the cost of our own sacrifice. Not only for ourselves, but for others at our expenses. It's not going to be, it can't be the expenses of others at our expense. If we have to say, I'm going to diminish myself to do for others, let us do so. With our hearts clean, not making sure that the right hand knows that the left hand is doing, but doing because we know it's the right thing. We know that tomorrow I don't have to go back and face what I left undone or I did wrong in this, path, and, um, this pathway. So this is the idea of habit. We can go on for hours talking about what we understand about habits in our lives now. Just by talking about our own habits, we can learn from one another, yes. But the idea here is for us to bring this shift, this reanalysis that Emmanuel is bringing to us about habits, right? And we move to a very dear topic in Spiritism as well, duty. What do you think, or what comes to mind when we hear the, uh, the word duty? Obli obligations. Have to. Have to, okay. Responsibility, okay. What else? Work. Work. <laughs> Duty free, anybody? <laughs> right? Well, I'm, it, it, every anything that comes to mind, it's okay. We hear the words, you know. It's like, because I didn't know what you know what it was when I heard when I was a kid. It was like, what is duty free? And I had to find out what is duty free. And then, and then I learned the purpose of the idea of duty free as well. Why people, you know, paid more attention. All these things, right? Um, so it, it's, and I think the kids also asked recently when we crossed the border. Um, so it, it's one of those things that it's important for us to, um, to analyze, right? What is the concept, what, what is the connotation for me of this word idea, this idea of duty? And it is correct. Um, responsibility, liability, accountability, right? All the things that is there um, that we see duty also, um, depending in the area that you are, um, will have different meaning. But once again, Emmanuel from the spiritual realm is saying, wait a minute, that's the mundane idea of duty. Let us reanalyze this. He says the following, duty is defined by submission to certain principles established by divine wisdom as laws for our self-development. We see the, the what it is, right? And again, the purpose for our self-development. Without discipline, there can, there can be no security. And we'll understand later on what, the, what he's trying to say. In the subatomic world, particles obey natural law. Likewise, constellations follow in un unison with their celestial glory. People travel long distance through the air, far from their homes, yet they would not be able to do so without obedience to the laws that govern the movement of the airplane carrying them. We may then symbolically describe duty as a series of activities in the arena of goodness that the Supreme Lord gives us the responsibility to execute. This is done to uphold order and the advancement of His divine work and for own self-development. A lot, right? So let's break this down. We have responsibility. With what? We have to work. For what? For development. For development right? Evolution. Huh? Evolution. Evolution. Right? With the divine laws. Right? Submitting yourself. The submission that many of us don't like the word submission because it puts us this way. It's not. It's the opposite. For someone who is flexible enough to work with what he has in his hand or she has in his hand, it's much greater than someone who can, who, who can and will work only with the abundance of life. It's very hard when you have little and you multiply the little, right? It's easy for you to multiply millions. 
the interest that you're going to apply to the millions, it's going to give you more money, <laughs> right? In the financial world. And that it's with anything in life. So we have to have the discipline in both ways. In both ways. The same way the subatomic world follow this idea and the greater things of the universe also follow this idea, we have to follow this idea. When he's talking about the airplane, and I like this idea of the airplane because it's very, it's easy for us to grasp. How does the airplane takes off? Law of gravity and dynamics, right? So you have the turbines that is um, 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 really um, pushing the, uh, the airplane, right, straight forward, right? And the dynamics of the, the wings helps create what? Lift, right? And then you have the rotors and you have everything else. There is a law. It's not that we're breaking the physical law, but we are using what we have with our intention, with our intention and our intelligence to put that huge thing in the air. And it stays in the air. And if you were to ask, let's say, uh, any air, 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 um, airplane right now that has about um, 100 to 200 um, individuals in there, they'll probably say, oh, I don't know. It's supernatural. I paid a ticket. I'm here, right? But there is a law that they're not breaking. They're working with. And this is just amazing because we do this in our lives day in and day out. We work with what we have. I have this physical body that many of us may say, oh, you know, it's a tall, it's a good body, but I know my difficulties, that each one of us also have our difficulties with the physical body. We work with what we have. The husband that the neighbor has, the wife, the car, the so on, the kids, and then it goes on and on and on. We took from the airplane, right, that we were able to create these beautiful machines, the turbines, to pull the huge airplane. We create this beautiful wing that some of them, obviously part of them, part, part of it moves, and we bring the airplane up, and we're flying. And we don't know, and sometimes we're in this idea as well, and we forget what we have around ourselves. So what is my duty? What do I have to submit to with the environment, within the environment, to make it better, to make all us fly together and glide through the air? That is the idea that he's trying to bring to us of duty. If you want to read more, and we're gonna, um, I'll bring the, uh, the chapter soon, um, there is a passage um, on the gospel according to spiritism that talks about duty in this revolutionary way as well of eternity, right? But let us remember this, the submission to certain principles established by divine wisdom as laws for our self-development. Look at the purpose. Each intelligent consciousness may be compared to a ray in the sphere of life, evolving from the surface to the center. Its obligation is to respect, promote, facilitate, and support the common good. A spontaneous attitude that will receive the natural help of all who have benefited from its sympathetic gestures and cooperation. Each spirit shapes its own reflexes wherever it may be, thereby disposing itself to receiving reflexes of the more enlightened minds, which in turn will lead it to contemplate broader horizons towards progress and to acquire the higher values of life. So, by fulfilling our mortal duty, to which we are continuously altered by our, we are continually altered by our conscience, we both project our best and receive the best of others. Give and take, give and take. Let's go back to the first part, the first paragraph there that, that we, we bring in this slide. Um, and one of the things that I want to highlight real quick is, and Emmanuel acknowledged this idea of the evolving from the surface to the within, that we always try to go back. It's okay, that's how we shape ourselves, right? We see, we identify beauty, we copy. In many ways, even the, you know, the women and the guys combing their hair, whatever, whatever way. We see, we see something that we, symmetrical, we, we follow the, sym, sym, um, the symmetrical shapes. We follow what we identified, we identify as being beautiful, right? As being, uh, being um, as connecting with the things of the past that perhaps brings us joy. 
And then we start to internalize and finding that within ourselves. It's that quest that we go, that we're being asked now. Because the world sometimes does not give us truly what is beautiful, uh, but it's a start. And then when we start to dive in, we start connecting with these other minds. When we take these reflexes and we start helping others for greater causes in our everyday submissions that we mentioned before, that Emmanuel mentions before, then we start connecting with higher minds. Then the divine assistance that we have mentioned last week here, that we mentioned today as well, it's more part of us. And then we say, wow, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I never really pay attention to this. This Thursday we were actually talking about being in connection with the divine, right? That sometimes we have those, you know, moments of our lives that is like lapses, right? What happened, right? Laura is looking at me like <laughs> those moments of, oh, wow, you know, when, when it's spring and it's, you know, we see the flowers, we see all the beautiful things. And it's like, where did time go? Right? Imagine if we were utilizing our energies and we are connecting with these higher minds and the responses that we're getting is perhaps moment like this, moments like those. So it's important that we take a step in our evolution in the sense of how do I connect with higher minds? I used to ask a lot. Um, you know, I really never saw my mentor. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of, many of us in the spirit, spiritist arena say, oh, I never, you know, I, I see my mentor, I talk to my mentor, we have a conversation, and it's like, okay, where's my mentor? <laughs> it's, it's true, you know, many of us perhaps have that idea. It's like, where is it? Where is this person? I want to meet him. What's the name? And, you know, what does it look like? Right? And it's okay to, to really go into that quest if it doesn't disturb you in, in, in any way. But how do I get to connect with that higher mind by having higher, having higher ideals in our lives? Thinking more positive, feeling more positive, educating ourselves, right? So creating new habits, because that person, that spirit wants to help us. So that's the idea there. This chapter, I have to say, before it ends, doesn't end in a positive way. Kind of an alarming, but also a reassuring way that we need to change, right? Because it's going to lead us into the following chapter, which is guilt. Next session. But let's finalize this first before we can think of the next. <laughs> Many times, however, we disturb, real, real, real quick, connecting with higher minds, right? So we're up here. He's saying at the end, so by fulfilling our mortal duty, to which we are continuously altered by our conscience, we both project our best, and receive the best of others. Now, look at this. Many times, however, we disturb the work the Lord entrusted us to do. We not only disassemble the mechanical part of our existence, we also cause disorder to many other lives by disturbing many parts in the machine of destiny. Mads, hang in there. Hang in there. Hence, the inexorable Compulsion for a great inner struggle that we then must face that may be called regenerative duty. This allows us to develop the reflexes that renew our individuality in relation to those to whom we own our sacrifices. This is why we receive by the imposition of circumstance an intolerant wife, a quarrelsome husband, a rude boss, an unhappy worker, an incurable in illness, and a work assignment that favor others. These functions as a spiritual tilling ground where we achieve our re is a excuse me, spiritual ground where we achieve our rehabilitation through hard work. Consequence. The consequences of not doing the things that we're supposed to do. So it's important that we look at the um, <laughs> the environment around us and we see the struggles we acknowledge because nobody's here to say that it's easy but this is what we have to work with if God is giving me a little Cessna <laughs> to fly guess what 
let us fly. If I've been given an Airbus to, you know, put up there, guess what? It's not going to be easier. It's going to be much harder, more fuel, all those things. So don't think that the bigger, spacious airplane, it's not the, it's not the easy world. It's probably much harder, right? So this is one of the things that we really have to make sure that when we talk about duty, is acknowledging what we have, is acknowledging ourselves. To finalize, therefore, it is useless to run away from the heavy obligations in which we find ourselves due to the force of natural circumstances along our pathway. Let's stop. How many times do we run away from the things that we have to do? <laughs> right? All the things that we, we like to say, oh gosh, not today, perhaps tomorrow. I'm tired today. I'm not going to think about this. Well, if we had perhaps planned in our prosperity, right, to say, I don't want to go through this, or if I find these roadblocks, I'm going to, creating the habits, look how one thing leads to the other, creating the habits to say, this will be for us to, for me to get better, and for those around me and a group of people, and then that will hopefully extend through the good habits of these individuals as well, perhaps we we're not going to have issues, or unleft um, or undone duties that we had to actually execute. And we don't have to tell ourselves, look, uh, Leo, not right now. Eh, don't worry about this now. Worry about this in the future. And we postpone. Second thing, how many fa um, uh, family members, friends, um, or even people who to test us come to us and say, don't worry about this now. It's going to be okay. Give yourself a break. It happens, right? And sometimes we think that those individuals, they like us. They do like us. Their intention is are good. But they forget that we also have a duty, as much as they also have a duty to, yes, enlighten us by saying, hang in there. I know it's not easy, right? Give yourself a break, but march on. Emmanuel brings this idea to us, not to really um, give ourselves into, let ourselves give into these uh, ideas, these thoughts, by saying, again, I'll read again, since Jeanette just got here. Therefore, it is useless to run away from the heavy obligations in which we find ourselves due to the force of natural circumstances along our pathway. Even though the gratefulness of others may try to free us from our renunciations, reason dictates from the depth of our conscience that we should be ever watchful over our tasks of patience and tolerance, humility and love to which are called, we are called, excuse me. If we fail to do so, regardless of, regardless of indications suggesting we can abandon our struggle, we will be weighted down by hidden sensations of disgust with ourselves and our weaknesses. It starts with mild irritations and minor discouragement. It ends by introducing our spirit into institutions for the sick or places us in the pit of frustration. This is the end of the chapter. Usually Emmanuel is like, let's do this, guys. He's like, no, 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 no. Do not leave for tomorrow what you have to do today. <laughs> And that's why we put this picture here. In the middle of the dryness, right, we have a flower. Did the work, came out. Utilized the water that is on, on the ground. The environment is perhaps really tough outside, but has the light outside. I can take the light, <laughs> right? The water is down there. I'll grab the water from down there. It's not on top. I'll get it whatever it's there and how many struggles we see like this day in and day out in our lives from other people examples of life right so we have to be really on guard of these things in our lives especially when it comes down to the things that it's our duty it's the 
difficult, again, co-worker, the difficult um, family member. They're all, we're all there. <laughs> we're all on both sides of the story many times in our lives. In this lifetime, imagine what we have done in the past. And imagine what we, have, we can do in the future as well if we start to work with ourselves and with others more effectively so that in the future we don't see these struggles. The land will be a little bit more wet. Like we see the rain now coming down, helping us out. Paula was saying that the plants will be happy, they'll be smiling, right, with all the rain that we're getting now. So it's important for us to acknowledge our environment. Bless the rain, bless the sun, bless the difficulty, bless the scarcity that we have within one another, right, between ourselves. Bless the abundance, but let us use it, use it, um, use it wisely. So this is the idea that we have for these three chapters. We again ask everyone to read, to really go after the book and read and make sure that you really come with your conclusions. Come to me, Leo, I understood this differently. We'll go and work together. <laughs> Next time, since we finished this idea of duty um, in an alerting way, right? We'll talk about guilt, which is not as bad as we think. I'll leave it that. Yes. Guilt is not as bad as we think. Assistance and humility as well. With no further ado, I would like to open for questions, for comments that we may have about these three amazing chapters that we just went through. Thank you, Leito. You're welcome. In regard of chapter 20 about habit, uh, when you were doing the presentation, I was remembering a talk that um, Raul, Raul Teixeira, he did years ago here at the SSB about habits, um, natural tendencies. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said that in order for us to develop goodness, and to surrender, to submit to God's laws, we need to create the habit of doing. So first, first of all, we, we force ourselves to do something, right? In order to create a habit. It's when we are teaching uh, a kid, uh, a little one, to create the habit of brushing their teeth after breakfast, to uh -huh. just to say something simple. Right. And the more you practice, First, it's like an obligation. Somebody needs to remind you. Somebody needs to push you. Somebody needs to tell you. After years of practice, hopefully, you will do it by yourself. And then it's after that, you just master that. And it's so natural that you just brush your teeth after breakfast, just to say something simple. So with moral development, it's basically the same. That's what he said. And I remember when he said, we start pushing ourselves to toward goodness, we need somebody to remind us, then it becomes a habit, and then it's a natural tendency. And that is why we see people like, uh, today we were watching the movie Mother Teresa again, and it seems so natural for her to help others, to serve others without distinction of religion or race or ethnicity, and it was very natural in her. It's very likely like a she create a habit through thousands of years. So hopefully it become being good in the sense with uh, uppercase is a matter of continuous practicing goodness. So then it will become something natural. Thank you. It is true. Um, it, it takes time. It takes um, dedication. It takes um, uh, us leaving the old behind and trying new things, um, exposing ourselves and doing all kinds of things. It depends on, on the arena and what we're going after, um, but it's definitely a repetition. Um, one of the things that I, 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 I like to add to that comment is as we were studying this idea of, of habit as well, we see the shift with kids, right? Where kids are for the first 12 years, you know, that pre-adolescence, 
you know, it's all good. So they kind of tend to go with the flow with what we're proposing. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom. Where does that come from? The spirit naturally is truly reincarnated now, right? Bringing all the things that, that we, we went through this, that we bring from past lives. It's this explosion, or it's this this, this um, uh, uh, the, the the all the, the bad habits that we have done for thousands and thousands of years coming out full and alive now, right? So we see the shift, and this is an example of what you just said. That it's we then have to say, wait a minute, this is what I've been bringing with me. This is what you're bringing with you. Let's go ahead and try to do this in, the, in this way. It's taking our energy, right? and um, put into a different direction and with a different um, tonality as well, right? Let's not put too much in this arena. Let's go this way, let's go there. So we help one another, like you said, we need to be reminded. Even after that adolescent year, right? We see sometimes we ourselves saying, I will not change this. And then guess what? Life invites us to do so, to change, in a way that is not so pleasant, but we do change and we create new habits because it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. And if we can connect with one another, it's through pain. Perhaps the pain may be felt a little bit different, but pain is pain. And then we change. Yasko. Or I was thinking about prosperity. <clears throat> This has been with us since we start to live in group, most likely, you know, taking first take advantage of the cooperation, but then try to take advantage of other people, you know, and do something bad. So I was thinking, did the prosperity also evolved through this thousands and thousands of years, you know, if changed. Uh, because if it stays the same, like was in one of your passage, the person that has this prosperous life will continue to do bad things, for instance, to struggle the weak ones, take advantage of the others, of the system, using the power in politics, uh, and ma manipulating more and more. Uh, so in order to cut off more quickly, you know, God should remove this prosperity from that family or from that group, then it's forced to learn, right? To go back and see how bad it was doing. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I think it may have evolved because now the companies, the big companies, they get together and there's not anymore in a family. They share bonds. Uh, stock mark uh, in the stock market. So right. those that has more share, they have more percentage mm -hmm. to what to say about the new directions or something. So it, it got a little bit more democratic than before when it stays a lot in an oligarchic model in a family. You know, it stayed for centuries in that family. You know. If that is the way that, that the divine laws is trying also to change, uh, to, to change the, the hands where this prosperity is going through, you know, in order to be more democratic. I don't know if it's true, my vision. I think the, I think the idea is good of, of the evolution of the idea of prosperity. I think prosperity, if you were to, I'm going to go we usually go from the bottom up, right? I'm going to go the opposite way. Let us think of prosperity for God. Or, eh, it's hard to explain. Take a step down. <laughs> let's think of prosperity for Jesus. Uh, let's take a step down. Let's think of prosperity of our mentors. I'm trying to get closer to our environment so we can understand. 
let's think of uh, prosperity for you know of our mentors looking or, or or organizing or trying to help us in this idea of prosperity with us. We are thinking about the prosperity of the money that we talked about here, but prosperity is for us to perhaps discarnate a little bit more freer of troubles that we we have incarnated with, right? Yeah, think about this as to be applied in a good way. Right, to be applied in a good way. Yeah, the but, but then, of right, so I'm thinking of this, and again, we look, let, let us now look at the tools, the physical tools that we have. And we, you mentioned the money, so let's continue with the idea of the money, right? Um, a big company. So what is my take in a, in a, um, in, with prosperity now with the, this company? I obviously will not do things that perhaps a more evolved planet is doing, but I will do the things that the environment is called us to do a little bit more, right? Is the example that we saw in Jesus, changing the status quo. Why am I going to um, take a, a, a huge paycheck home, that, let's say, of returns on my shares, since you mentioned the idea of shares of 100,000, when I can go ahead and ton, donate 20,000, Right, I'll take 80, donate 20, to make the environment for my co for my for the workers of the company to live and produce even more. Yes, people may say, okay, now you're giving money so they can produce more. Well, that's there, there's got to be a reason for that, right? It's not just for them to sit in a beautiful chair. Make the environment better, right? So the I think the evolving is us with the idea of prosperity, not prosperity in itself. Because for prosperity in, in, in higher planes is way more evolved than we can understand. So I think it's our evolutionary path, our minds, our conscience saying, uh, hunting was good for myself, right? But now I have to hunt for my family. You see, prosperity now for, for others. But now we also have to find a shelter, not only for my family, for my clan, for my tribe. Now we need to organize ourselves in a society. And prosperity start out my perception as a spirit towards prosperity is different. But this is a good point because everything evolves. Not only this idea of prosperity, but everything as well. And to acknowledge something else that you said, I do not know, and we, I don't think we know, the ways that God helps regenerating ourselves. But one, and we're going to talk in the next um, session, is right here. It's killed. We do the wrong things in life. We stop, reflect, we feel guilty, and then we're like, oh gosh, I need to change this. And then we reincarnate, instead of being that individual who took, 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 took for, the, for themselves and for their families, now I want to distribute this a little bit better. And then the following reincarnation, we do also the same. Good point. Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when I think of these topics, the first thing that people talk about are behaviors, like developing habits or behaviors, or when you talk about prosperity or sharing or whatever, they're all behaviors. The title of the book is Thought and Life. Mm -hmm. And underneath all those behaviors are our thoughts. Right. And controlling our thoughts, well, for me, it's really hard. And I've been reading this book in the morning, and this morning I said, I'm just going to have elevating thoughts. I'm going to use my words only to make sure that I'm elevating others. And the first thing I did after I said that was... <laughs> I talked in a disparaging way about my advisor at school. Oh. And I thought, oh my goodness. I just did <laughs> it. <laughs> it's the opposite right. of elevating, you know, using my thoughts to elevate others. And so I just wanted to mention how hard that is. It is. <laughs> and you really always have to notice it and be aware of your thoughts. Right. So, the title of the book, Thought and Life, is so appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. It is true. 
It is true. Um, I, that's why I went through the disclosure at the beginning to say it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And we, have, we will fall into the struggles of like, oh gosh, here again. I did it again. I was thinking about the, you know, the uh, prosperity in a completely mundane way. And we make the adjustments, right? And the invitation again is for us to be the evolutionary being that we can never forget that we are. That whatever I do now, have consequences. Whatever I don't do will have consequences, right? So we need to change. Thank you. Actually, that's a nice lead into how I was thinking. What, what I like about this chapter on duty is this concept of regenerative duty. To me, that's a new twist on suffering. They give the examples of you know, the wife or husband who's difficult to live with, the boss who's rude, the unhappy coworker. So what our mind immediately does is says, there's something wrong with that person. Or, you know, I, I don't really want to have to deal with this. But when we understand, uh -huh. <laughs> I have to then shift my reaction, which is an automatic mental reflex from the many lifetimes. I have to go, wow, a chance to grow. <laughs> I am going It sounds so cheesy, but it is true, right? <laughs> I am going to develop a new understanding and reflex here. Right. So I just thank you for the new words. I'm going to substitute regenerative Perfect. duty for something. Thank you. Think Emmanuel. I, so it, it's, it's, it is true, guys, because I wanted to correct something real quick. Um, the message that I, that I the part of the... Um, Gospel according to Spiritism that I brought is actually by um, a teaching from um, Kardec directly. Um, and the duty passage that we find in the Gospel according to the Spiritism is by the Spirit Lazar uh, on chapter um, 17, item 7. Yes, item 7. So also go and read because this idea of the pain, the regenerative pain is in there that he talks about this, this moment that is so difficult, right? That really marks our lives it, and, and at times leaves a scar. It does. And we will remember that for ages to come. We will tell our grandkids, I remember this time. And it's like, <laughs> and then the kids are like, yeah, here it comes again, you know. I already do that with my kids. I remember this time. This <laughs> and they're like, here he comes again, you know. So it is true that it is a moment for us to change. It's not easy. Nobody's saying that it's easy. And I think this is the um, most inviting aspect of our evolutionary path that when we come together and we share these things in a positive way. The, the worst thing is when you ask when somebody, how, how are you doing? And they say the negative things, but they say in a negative way, right? <laughs> it's like, oh Lord, why have I asked this? But it's, it, it's like, Look, it's, it's tough, but we're getting there, right? And, and then you say, well, wait a minute. It's tough, but we're getting there. How? Tell me how, because I want to learn, right? So I think this is the, the most inviting, inviting part of this whole process, regenerative process, that we share with one another. We, we contemplate our, our struggles. We contemplate our, um, our, you know, what we do well, our good habits, and we develop more. You know, we share these things so that we can grow faster. If we want a regenerative planet, we, re we have to regenerate ourselves. It's not gonna be easy, Laura, right? When you have to, and you're like, wait a minute. But the, the way that it works for me, and I share the beginning, I'll share again, is to think that we're millionaire spirits. And that helps, because I don't want the, my thoughts, right? Or the, the conjunction of mental reflexes that I have within me now, to hurt me in the future. So I want to change it now, right? I love to give this example of being the third child of the family. Did I suffer? Yes, I did. <laughs> but there were a lot of mistakes that my, bro my older brothers did that I said, mm, I don't want Donna Flavia, how we actually call my mother, to you know, come after me and she's gonna use that. Your brother was already going through this. So it was the most amazing thing, one of the most amazing thing of my life to be the third son because I saw some of their, their mistakes 
enormous learn. mistakes, and I learn with it. Okay. And this is an invitation for all of us, not only in the individual arena, but also collective. What uh, that individual is doing, I'm not going to do it. What that society is doing, I will try my best to help the society that I live in not to do the same. And then also transfer that to the positive way. The good things that they did, I need to do it as well. I need to multiply it. They gave me the example. As well as the good things that we are living in our societies, we need to multiply it. So we thank you again for bearing with us a little over than what we thought. Um, but next chapters, guilt, assistance, and humility. Thank you so much. And we would like to go through our visualization tonight and close our evening as well.